Good morning, everybody. Welcome to TLD Cast. It's Thursday. Thanks for being here, everybody. Looks like we have a fantastic crew dropping into the chat window. Thanks for joining us today. For those of you that might be new, we are the Training, Learning, and Development Cast. But more than that, more importantly than that, we are the Training, Learning, and Development Community. We also are the Training, Learning, and Development Conference and Chat, and many more to come. So if you're interested, please hit us up at the website that my good friend Craig Seibert just dropped into the chat. If you work in training, learning, and development, we are a community of professionals for you. As it says right up on the screen, interactive live streaming broadcasts for the training, learning, and development community. That's what TLDcast is. But again, more importantly, we are a community of professionals doing the work of training, learning, and development. And so we are here to support you. This community is yours. If you don't have the title of training manager, training professional, instructional designer, uh, maybe you're not a CLO, that's okay too because everybody actually does the work of training, learning, and development. At some point in your life, somebody has probably asked you, hey, you know how to do that. Could you help me? And you had to offer your expertise. That instantly made you a training and learning and development professional. So if you enjoy doing that, if you enjoy sharing your knowledge, and everybody should, uh, this is a great place to just learn and to share with others and to figure out how you might be more effective at doing that and sharing your knowledge and scaling up your knowledge. Scaling up is a big topic that we like to discuss on a regular basis around here. And that is an important part of what we do and what live streaming broadcasts like ours can do for you. So we learn a lot of here every single day. Thanks for being with us. We have a bunch of sponsors that you can check out. They support us in many, many different ways, and we appreciate all of them. Please, please, please also be sure to hit up the website and look for the little button about membership. TLD Chat and TLD Cast will always be free. This is something that we've promised ourselves, and we've actually had conversations about maybe changing that, but uh, we like to stick with our roots and keep it that way. And what helps us is your support. So becoming a paid member is a great way for you to say, you know what, I'm getting a lot of great value out of these conversations and being a part of this community. And I would like to support you guys in making sure that this continues. And we really, really appreciate everybody that has stepped up and become a paid member of the community. Thank you all so much. And uh, don't forget that you also get some pretty fantastic uh, benefits by being a paid member as well. So be sure to look into that. And we look forward to having you and seeing you in TLD chat as well. TLD chat is our text-based 24-7 conversation that we hold inside of Slack. And you do need an invite um, to get um, into that space, but we can just share a link with you. It's not a problem at all. Um, it's just kind of the way Slack works. So um, just let us know. And uh, and you can get that invite if you need it. I can't even remember. Maybe if you just click that fancy link that Craig just dropped in, maybe everything will be just fine. But I don't know, Craig, did I hit on all my topics? What am I forgetting? Oh, yes. Please invite all of your friends. There is an invite button just above the chat window. Oh, yes. And the podcast. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Craig. I'll remind you about the podcast. Um, invite all your friends to come hang out with us. Click on that invite button and share it out to Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Plus, or Facebook and let everybody know that we're going to have a fantastic conversation today with the wonderful Kevin Yates, who I will be with just momentarily. And uh, also be sure to hit up not the podcast, but the podcast on iTunes. There's some great content there. If you can't be with us every morning, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. UK time, then you can always listen to the recording. And like some of our regulars, listen to it at 1.25 speed or 1.5 speed, and you can get all the value even faster. 
And if you're wondering if that's even possible, can you still learn and get as much information and content at that speed? Our resident neuroscience expert says, yes, there is research that says listening to podcasts at that speed is still valuable and you can consume that content. So, you know, it's just all the little things that we uh, talk about and learn every single day. Hello, everybody. Sam, Toddy, on everybody that's here. Good to see you all. Bethany, good to see you too. What a fantastic group. Wow, it's a big, big group already. We're going to be talking about analytics and data today. And I know that we all kind of talk about it sort of tangentially, if that's a word. Yeah, did I say that right? To all the other topics that we discuss, right? Data always pops up. Everybody says, I got to have the data. How do we get the data? You know, we talk XAPI and all this crazy fun stuff. Well, guess what, people? We have a fantastic expert with us today who is not only a data person, but he's one of us. That makes it even more fantastic. He's an L&D guy. Please help me welcome Kevin Yates, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How's it wow. going? It's going great. I, I didn't know that we had an audible audience. <laughs> I love the hand clap. <laughs> yeah, that's my fake audience. It, it, people, I just I like to play with the soundboard. Uh, it, it, some of our audience members don't appreciate it, but um, they, they've come to love it anyways. <laughs> I like it. I like well, it. Well, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, you know what? Let's just start out. This is always fun for me when we have guests that I've never met before, because then our conversation is kind of like everybody in the chat's conversation, because they're just meeting you, too. So, why don't you just give us a quick introduction and just tell us a little bit about who Kevin Yates is. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And the first thing I'd like to do is say hello to all of my l &D brothers and sisters in the house. <laughs> That's I connect with you all. And so I'm really excited and happy to be here. Summary of my background, uh, I have been a learning and development professional now, gosh, for more years than I want to say. Let's just say that I am very well preserved. <laughs> Where I started out in learning and development as a facilitator, day-to-day uh, -day training in a classroom, uh, and that led to a role in instructional design. Uh, that led to a role in curriculum development, and continuing on in my career, that led to a role in learning solutions design and development, which ultimately led to a role in global learning. And so I did some program management, some operations management, some L&D administration. I moved into a role for learning technology where I was implementing learning management systems and other types of solutions for learning development. And then about three or four years ago, Brent, I was at a crossroads in my career where I wanted to really do something different. And I began to ask my own self the question, has everything that I've done up to this point made an impact on anyone or anything? And that's where I totally shifted. And I was fortunate because I met Jack Phillips and Patty Phillips and another gentleman, Dick Hanshaw. And they just really inspired me to take my career in a different direction, to leverage the work that I had done over, you know, over my career, but to really begin to focus on measurement and data and analytics. So that's, uh, that's the, the one minute Reader's Digest version of my background. <laughs> that is awesome because my next follow-up question is always tell us your origin story kind of how you got to where you are but i think you nailed it in the intro there that's good i hope so yeah and he didn't plant that question team by the way i just want you guys to know he didn't plant that so <laughs> yeah, oh, yes yes absolutely it, it was uh you know it was good stuff yeah because it's you know, we talk about everybody that joins L&D or that is a learning and development professional. Everybody comes at it from very, very interesting angles, right? Either uh, previously educators, or higher ed, or even K through 12, or maybe they were, um, you know, just a, a classroom training facilitator, or uh, there are people, um, uh, you know, boy, what are all of the different options, right? There are people that come out of many, many, many different angles and all of a sudden decide, wow, I want to be a trainer. I mean, yeah. we have a, we have a silversmith who uh, decided all of a sudden to change his career to uh, being a trainer. We've had, um, we have a resident rocket scientist. He doesn't join us much uh, in the live chat, but uh, uh, he's a good friend and part of the community. So uh, yeah, I mean, just people from all walks of life. 
I guess he debunked that whole myth, Brent. It really does take a rocket scientist. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we, we always have a good laugh about that, but he's a, he's a really good guy. Yeah, we were we were talking uh geosynchronous orbits the other day in a in a chat room and uh it's something that has always perplexed me and and he's he's helping me try to get a better understanding of it so uh, always always good but anyways we've got a lot of stuff to talk about and not much time so let's just dig right into it and start with a, just a very simple question so so we know kind of how you got into, uh, you know, you're in the L&D world, you've done a lot of the L&D stuff, and now you're learning about or have been learning about, you know, how would, you know, the data side of things and the analytics, how would you describe the impact and that sort of change? And why is that important to the L&D community? Well, I think that, and for me, it's been a very uh, interesting to see the pendulum shift. So, you know, I started in learning development back in the day where our impact was judged on our glossy catalogs that would come out on an annual basis that had the long listing of all yeah. the courses that were offered, right? So yeah. that's what I remember when I first started in learning and development. And so now you shift forward to today, 2018, where the conversation is really changing and senior leaders and executives are beginning to hold learning and development teams accountable to a very different standard than that which we've been held before. So now executives and senior leaders are asking what impact is learning development, the team and the effort having on our business goals, having on people's performance, having on the extent to which we are doing the things that we said we want to do as a business. So, you know, Brent, when I think about it, it's been an interesting paradigm shift. Um, and again, I'm saying now where we're just being held accountable in ways where we have not been held accountable before. So for me, I think that when I decided to make that shift, I did it at the right time because I see myself now as a bridge between learning development and senior leaders and executives. And so me being that bridge, I am answering those questions for senior leaders to say, here's the impact. And for learning and development teams, I am helping them answer those questions with data and analytics as fact-based evidence. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Yeah, I've just got my head's just exploding right now. I got 20 different directions I could take this in. But I, let's, I, I like to try to keep things simple, but deep dive a little bit and, yeah. and become as practical as we can. So what um, the first thing that kind of struck me was, so what are these executives asking for like what would be a, a data set that that they would be asking for that maybe we haven't addressed before that maybe we as an industry need to better understand yep that's a great question and i'd like to start uh answering that question with telling you what they aren't asking for oh. because then we can exclude what we are traditionally or have traditionally provided that we have the potential to stop providing to senior leaders so Senior leaders are not interested in how many people were trained. They were, they're not interested in how many hours of training we offered. They're not interested in how many courses we offered in our catalog. And they aren't interested in whether or not people like the food at a training event. Okay. <laughs> but what they are interested in is seeing data that shows the extent to which there was a change in behavior or a change of performance as a result of learning development. And they want to see that measured against a specific business goal. So, for example, there might be a goal in the business to reduce errors, or there might be a, a goal in the business to improve efficiency or change some type of process or improve, imp improve client satisfaction. So those are all goals. And there are measures against those goals for the business, right? And those usually, that usually comes in some type of qualitative or quantitative metric. And so what senior leaders are looking for is a chain of evidence that shows the extent to which a learning and development experience or solution has helped the organization reach a goal. So did learning and development result in a change of performance that ultimately impacted a reduction in errors or an increase in sales or you know, um, some type of improvement in a cycle time? So what they're really looking for is that performance data that sheds light on the extent to which a change of performance led to an impact on, an, on a goal that an organization has for for its business. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. And and I was just about to say what Bethany just dropped into the chat. She, the the chain of evidence is a fantastic term. I have not heard yet. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you know? you why, no, I was going to say, I'll tell you why I use that. When I talk about a chain of evidence and I talk about performance, I'm not excluding some of the other measures or some of the things that we in learning development have traditionally measured because I don't believe we need to throw those out the window. So you recall, I talked about Singulators really not being interested in many hours and how many courses. Yep. That is a part of the chain of evidence. But when we get to the point where we want to talk about performance impact and business impact, that's where we want to tell that story to our senior leaders and executives. When we're talking about data that shows how many people were trained, how many courses were offered, etc., that is what I call operational data. And it is important because as we evaluate ourselves as a learning function and when we talk about running training like a business, that kind of data and those kinds of analytics are important. So we just want to make the difference between to whom we share what, because the target audience really determines the data that we provide and the types of analytics in which we engage. So for senior leaders and executives, it's impact, right? And then for the learning and development team, there might be some activity data in there as well. But at the end of the day, it's two separate data and analytic streams for two different audiences. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. I, I love it. It's perfect. Um, Craig has a great question that I that I should get clarified beforehand. Are you yep. currently working with a company doing all of this or are you a consultant learning this and sharing all of this knowledge and helping people make that shift? That's a great question. I am a consultant. And so I am working with organizations who don't have the expertise for data and analytics. So they bring me in to help them with that. So if you go to my website um, and click on the expertise tab, you can see the clients with whom I am currently working or those with whom I have worked. Great question. Yeah. And, and this is great. So this helps kind of craft it because uh, when you work with so many, sometimes when you work inside of one organization, you get a little tunnel vision, right? And you, you, you know, a lot of what you're thinking about is, and we've got a lot of corporate folks here that join us um, that, you know, you're, you're just kind of, you only see what's going on in that industry and that organization, but it's different in so many other ways in other organizations. So, so to have a different perspective and to be able to see those commonalities leads right up to my next question is, um, you know, they're all looking for that data and um, there is that major transition. And you're, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, you know, finding that other data to me, this transition is much more than just L and D needing to transition and change because a lot of that data um, comes from other departments in other areas. So there is from a tactical perspective, we as an industry need to get better about engaging those other areas. And do you have any experiences you could share with us on how, how you help the full organization make this shift, not just yeah. the L&D department? I love that question because the essence of what you're talking about goes back to what I talked about, the chain of evidence that leads to learning and development's impact on people's performance and organization goals. So if we think about that chain of evidence, the data that we're looking for not only includes the data in our LMS and other uh, points from which we gather and collect uh, learning data, but if we're going to keep that chain of evidence going all the way through to performance, it means that we have to work with other parts of the business, right? So we may need to work with the sales team so that we can get the data out of the customer relationship management tool, or we may need to work with the HR team so that we can get data from the HRIS and from the performance systems, or we may need to get data from the operations team and data from the finance team. So when we get all those pieces of data together and add them to our learning data, that's where we get that chain of evidence that takes us all the way through to business goal. To answer your question, Brent, it can be a challenge. And, and I like to be transparent and to borrow modern day vernacular, I like to keep it real. So <laughs> the essence of what I say when I say that is those parts of the business that I just talked about, customer relationship management, finance operations and all that, they aren't used to having the kind of relationship that I am talking about now. One where learning and development is saying, we like insight into the data that you own because we want to determine the extent to which what we're doing is impacting some of the data and the metrics that you own. Here's the secret to that success. 
It shouldn't be learning and development going to those other parts of the business to ask for data. It should be a senior leader or an executive who owns a specific goal and is accountable for that goal that goes to those other parts of the business on learning and development's behalf to say, I am working on creating a chain of evidence that shows everything that has impacted what I am responsible for doing. I am responsible for increasing customer satisfaction. I am responsible for reducing errors. I am responsible for improving cycle time. So that senior leader who owns whatever that goal of that initiative is, is the one who goes to the other parts of the business to say, please work with our L&D team as they are building this chain of evidence, because not only do I want to see how we're doing in your area in terms of what your data says, but I also want to see how we're doing with the L&D data. And the best way to do that is to bring it all together. So again, it's not L&D going to those different groups and functions. It's that senior most leader who owns that particular strategy or that particular goal and who is held accountable for ensuring that that goal is met. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah. So you need a champion, yeah, yeah. So you need a champion to drive all of the drive. Yes. All of Connection. Yes, yes, because the reality is that, you know, I've been in learning development for quite a while, and I know that there are some perceptions out there about who we are and what they do, and I, what we do, rather, and I believe that most of them are false, and I'm biased, obviously, because I'm just like the rest of you, my learning development brothers and sisters. I know we're adding value. I know we're making impact, but training just has this connotation to it for some. So when you go to someone or, you know, a group with whom you've not traditionally worked and you have a request for sharing data, their first question is more often than not, why does training need my data? Why does training need customer relationship management data? Why does training need operations data? So the best way for us to get what we need is to be aligned to a senior leader or an executive who owns a particular strategy or initiative and let him or her work on our behalf. Does that make it makes sense? perfect sense. Yeah. And so, um, let me kind of turn us briefly, uh, but this is still on topic, I think, um, to the technical side of it. So, um, and, and, may, and maybe this is too much of a, a 90 degree turn for some folks here who, um, you know, but how, how is it then that you work to get that data? So are you saying, um, you know, you're a big proponent of XAPI and have you integrated that into it or are there other ways that you've done it? Or, I mean, because these are conversations that I've had even just recently in other groups about, um, you know, all of the talks about the transition and what we should be doing, right? And engaging with all these other departments is great, but then when it's yeah. time for the rubber to hit the road, a lot of times nobody really knows how to get that data, right? Or even how, yeah. and then how to combine the data and then how to tell the story around all of that data coming together. You know, what What yeah. have you seen or what, how can you help us get our heads around that? Because that's a big, big technical problem. It really is. Um, I believe it's a technical challenge. Um, and I believe that there are three answers to your question, um, because the essence of what you're talking about is filling the talent gap. So I like to say that using data and analytics for learning and development is an art, a science and a skill. Um, and it's a capability that most learning and development teams don't have because of everything that you just talked about. So I believe that there are three options. Um, and again, just on some uh, unscientific research that I've done over the past year, I'm saying we're about 97% of learning and development teams, both big and small, don't have the capability and the expertise embedded on the team to use technology, to do analytics, to use different you know, software that helps you do it beyond Excel. So I believe that there's three solutions for that. Uh, the first thing is you can hire the talent. Now, granted, there's a pretty small of people out there who are like me, who are focused on it, but we're out there nevertheless. So, you know, again, the first thing you can do if you don't have the expertise on your team is to hire it. Uh, the second thing that you can do is to buy it, right? Because there are different types of vendors and consultants and groups out there that have the expertise for learning technology, learning measurement, learning data, learning analytics. You know, so again, you can hire it or you can buy it. And then the third thing that you can do is build it. So if you have curiosity and interest on your team, uh, you know, a staff member or someone who really is interested in learning how to use the technology and how to use the methods and how to use analytics for learning and development, there are professional development opportunities 
that that person can use and leverage so that he or she can grow in terms of their knowledge and capabilities. So again, Brent, I think that when we talk about those different ways, particularly on those teams where that uh, yeah. expertise doesn't exist, you know, you can hire it, you can buy it, or you can build it because it does take a very specific kind of capability and skill set to marry uh, data analytic capability with learning and development experience. And so when you combine those two, you know, you have an awesome person <laughs> to do the very niche work that, uh, that we do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah, and I think there, um, yeah, again, there's so many different directions we can go with that, but uh, that, is, that is extremely helpful. I know um, at TLDC 18, I facilitated a panel just this last week, and we were, we were having this conversation about uh, challenges in the workforce, right? And um, it was, I think it was specifically on the Arizona panel. So I got some Arizona leaders together of training departments, and, and the room was mostly filled with folks in Arizona where the event was in Phoenix. And we were having this conversation, and, and it came around to data and analytics. And I, I thought I was going to be smart and get no hands and say, you know, who, how many of you on the panel, you know, actually have a data person on your team? And both people raised their hands. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I thought this was an uncommon thing. But they, they actually have those folks on their team doing that already. So um, I think people are, seem to be moving in that direction, which is a good thing. Slowly but surely, um, and it's interesting because I am seeing that happen more in uh, larger businesses. So, in 2017, I saw roles posted for learning data and analytics. And if I can recall all the businesses, I remember uh, KPMG, uh, PwC, Verizon, Discover, Visa, Choice Hotels, Merck Pharmaceuticals, Facebook. These are the organizations that I see. Um, creating roles and having roles embedded on the learning development teams that are focused on analytics. So those are the big boys. Those are the big players, right? But I'm not seeing it as often in smaller organizations. So to your point, yeah. it's happening slowly but surely, but I see it happening more so in those larger businesses, more so you know, than I see them you know, in the smaller businesses. Yeah. But at some point, I would guess that it, it just ne is going to need to be part of of a curriculum in training training professionals and learning and development professionals that data and analytics is is just it's just got to be part of what everybody understands at least at a basic level right i mean like you said obviously is the bigger enterprises you know the global 2000 companies that can afford to have big teams and people yeah. focusing on special areas you know that that is great to see but in general i just think that even the one man band that you know can can absolutely benefit from educating themselves on how they can get this knowledge, how they can impact the business as opposed to just the butts and seats categories. Yeah, and, and not only that, you know, I'm seeing where there are more organizations that are making data-driven decisions about instructional design, right? So yeah. not only are we using data to show impact, but we're also using data to inform decisions, right? So to your point, even someone like an instructional designer um, will be expected, I believe, in the future to use data to inform the different types of decisions that are being made about modalities and about the creation of instruction, um, you know, about the creation of curriculum. So I can see where data and analytics and its use will ultimately embed all facets of the learning development organization. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's got to get there at some point because it seems like everything is data, 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 data yeah. in all industries, not just ours. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I would also add to that because to, to all my l and brothers and sisters that are out there watching and listening right now, I am, uh, I am being more vocal about the idea that the work is not easy. Uh, and I don't ever want to give anyone the impression that it's easy to use yeah. data and analytics for learning development because there are times where it's not. There is uh, there, there are different levels of difficulty with doing it, but the good news is that it's possible. So it not being easy doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just means that it takes a little bit of elbow grease <laughs> and it takes the right talent and the expertise to use data and analytics for learning development. Yeah. I don't ever want to give anyone the impression 
that it's simple just like that because it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And and I love that. Thank you for adding that because so often uh, there are, uh, especially when somebody's trying to sell something to you, right? A tool or something like that. It, it's it, the impression is, is that it's super easy. And uh, yeah, a, a lot of the work that we do is not, especially during these transitional phases, if anything else, we need to be working harder than we ever have to help all of these transitions happen and I'm getting the signal that it's halftime for me. So I'm going to take a quick break here, Kevin. Okay. And, uh, and then we'll come right back. And what we'll do when I come back is so you can check these out beforehand too, by the way. So if you look down below the videos, there is a link called ask a question with a number next to it. If you click on that, uh, Oh, I don't, Oh yeah. You don't need to change your glass. Sorry. (laughs) I'll just ask the question. (laughs) <laughs> don't worry about it if you can't no don't worry about it sorry i i was just gonna say if you want to check those questions out now so you know what i'm gonna be asking you i'm gonna go into that question queue for our our second 30 minutes and we'll talk to those but don't worry about it it's all good awesome <laughs> all right all right everybody hey, you know what this is fantastic this is the kind of conversation that we live for around here this is the important work that we do in training learning and development and uh so thank you so much uh, kevin for being here with us and um everybody in the chat for hanging out and 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 having this conversation with us before i even forget and go on to any of the other thank yous and the sponsor stuff this is such a great conversation i will just shout out one more time and say hit that invite button and tell all your friends on twitter linkedin google plus facebook um, that, uh, that, that this is an important conversation that everybody in our in- industry, um, it needs to be engaging with. So, um, so let them know, uh, there's plenty of room to join, so they don't have to worry about that because we did kind of overflow the other day, but, uh, we got plenty of room today. This is really important. So please come in. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, in the chat, especially to all of the volunteers, Uh, We couldn't do any of this stuff that we do without you guys. You help so much. And, uh, um, you know, most of what makes TLDC great is you guys and the the team effort that we talked about yesterday. Uh, Craig, big shout out to you. Thank you so much. Joe Cook, thank you so much for being our our UK representative and, and supporting us so strongly. Really, really appreciate that. Toddy, thank you so much. Bethany, thank you for engaging with us. Kara, I don't know if she's still in, but uh, or if she even was able to drop in today, but um, she helps us out a lot with our social media. For those of you that were following the back channel from TLDC 18, you saw the uh, the magic and the power of social media um, by uh, by Kara. She just she really owned that very strongly. And, um, and we really, really appreciate her for doing that. So, uh, so thanks everybody so much for being a part of what we're trying to do here at TLDC and making a difference, impacting our community of professionals that do the work of training, learning, and development. And we couldn't do this work without the support of vendors, uh, the vendors who sponsor us, not only the vendors who sponsor us, but Um, all of the vendors in the industry. There are a lot of vendors that hang out with us in the community and they are fantastic group. And one of the things that we try to do here at TLDC is help bridge that gap between the users and the vendors. This should not be such a strained relationship between practitioners and vendors. And unfortunately, it feels like sales processes of old are to blame for that. And we want to help fix that. We want to help everybody uh, engage better with the vendor community. And we also want to educate the vendor community and those salespeople and help them to understand that if you really want to get in with our good graces and get people to like what you have to offer, it's all about engaging and providing value, not giving us the hard sell every time we walk by your booth or hit up your website or on and on and on and on and on. We love you guys. Don't get us wrong. We love vendors. We love all of the things that you create for us to use. We love our consultants. I am one. Everybody in the chat is more than likely a consultant now, has been or wants to be. 
Um, you know, it is a very, 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 um, you know, strong place to be. And I just want everybody to know that we are doing everything that we can to, um, to bring value to both sides of the equation. So big, big shout out and thank you to everybody who buys in and appreciates uh, this, this new method and the effort that we're taking to make these relationships worthwhile. To TechSmith, who does such a fabulous job of, of no hard sell whatsoever, just providing value on a regular basis. The folks at MindSpace that stepped up and supported the, the reception, um, Mike and Intuition and CybeSafe, and designing digitally, Andrew can't say enough fantastic things about the wonderful and and famous Andrew Hughes at designing digitally. He does such fantastic work with his team, and they're also hiring. I don't know if Kara is here, but uh, they are looking for 3D game developers, instructional designers, um, coders of all sorts. Uh, fantastic team to work with on different projects. And these particular spots are um, for consultants to be virtual. So if you have those skills and you are a consultant, uh, hit up Andrew or Kara at Designing Digitally, and um, they can help you get through that process. And Versal as well. I, I don't want to skip out on any of our sponsors. but um, And there are other vendors in our community that do great, great work for us that we maybe just haven't connected with in our um, in, in our community just yet, we're working really hard at finding all of the vendors that really, really fit what it is that we're trying to do here. And, uh, so if you guys know of any, any, um, any vendors that you think would really appreciate the kind of thing that we're doing at TLDC, uh, again, this community is yours, uh, as, as much as anyone else's. And so, uh, all the help you can provide to help us and to help them get value from the work that we all provide is a great thing. So, um, so thank you all so much for being here, for being a part of the community. Really, really appreciate it. Hit up the website and be sure to invite your friends again. And I went way too long on that, but I just all of a sudden felt this need to talk to everybody about that because I feel very strongly about it. And it's, it's something that um, I think needs to be fixed in our industry. And I, I hope we can help in, in a very small way, if nothing else. So How'd that sound, Kevin? I agree with what you said, particularly about, you know, transforming our relationships with vendors, right? You know, sometimes it's not about the sale. Uh, sometimes it's about the solution. And by solution, I don't mean the solution itself, but I mean addressing a particular challenge or problem that we're having. So, you know, I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's something that's been a long time coming. It's something that's kind of bothered me for years being in this industry for a long time as well. And, um, it, there just, there just doesn't seem to be any reason for anything other than great relationships because we all need each other. We're one big, huge ecosystem and we couldn't, one could not survive without the other. And so there's got to be a better way for us all to communicate and, you know, rising tides lift all boats, right? Is that what they say? Yeah. Did I, did I, did I get that yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And just, just to bring it back to our topic and you touched on it a little bit. You know, there are solutions that are out there for data and analytics for learning development. You know, there are vendors who have learning record stores. There are vendors who are offering XAPI. And then there's different vendors for data visualization and analytics capability. But what we yep. really want to focus on, the extent to which all of that technology and all of those methods and all of those solutions can actually help us answer the question at the end of the day, the training work, you know, really answering the question at the end of the day, did learning and training and development impact performance and impact an organization's goals? And as I said earlier, even with the latest technology, using the best in class method, using the different tools, even with that support, it's not always an easy thing to do. But again, it's possible. It's just not easy. And so for me, yeah. you know, I think that we should be having just as much a conversation about the challenges that there are with using data and analytics for learning development um, as we are talking about its use and its success. So I think that it needs to be a healthy balance between the two, because when we create the idea that it's easy and simple to do, then we are not creating the right types of expectations from the business when we do that. So I just think, again, between um, you know, our, the conversations we're having with vendors, the conversations we're having amongst ourselves as training, learning and development professionals, 
and the conversations that we have with the business, we need to always be realistic. We need to talk about what we can do, what we can't do, where we can be successful and where we might have some challenges. Yeah, you know what? We're, there is so much for us to talk about, and we got 20 minutes left. We're going to have to have you back on, right? So are you going to be okay I'll with that? Can we invite you back? I could talk about this all day, so yeah, uh, definitely. You and me both, right? We could just stay live all day long and just have this conversation. That'd be a ton of fun. But uh, everybody's got to, got, you got to pay the bills. We all got meetings and, and other work to do. So we'll just yeah. have you back on at another time for sure. Because again, awesome. I think this conversation is a great topic. So I'm going to go into these questions because I'm getting oh, burned pretty hard by everyone. Uh, and the top one, I think we already covered. I'm going to scroll down here real quick. Uh, so um, what's your response to people who say you can't use data and analytics for learning and development the same as you do in other parts of the business? Oh, we kind of covered that already, though, didn't we? Well, or We covered it a little bit. Um, and that's a great question because here's the reality. Again, to all my learning and development brothers and sisters out there, you know, I've often heard and have received a lot of pushback from not only other learning and development professionals, which is a little disheartening, <laughs> but also people in the business to say, learning and development is different. You know, it's not like anything else in the business. You guys are focused on people. How could you possibly measure impact? And to them, I say, we can measure impact and use data and analytics just like any other part of the business. We can do it just like marketing. We can do it just like finance. We can do it just like operations. The only difference is the data that we look at, right? So yeah. for me, when someone says to me, using data and analytics for learning development is unrealistic, um, you can't do it, it's not possible, to them I say that's not true. Um, and here's, here's a helpless, uh, a rather, uh, uh, what do they call a shameless plug. <laughs> I'm gonna be at ATD 2018 talking about that. I'm gonna be with three other experts, David Vance, Patty Phillips, and John Maddox, and we're gonna be talking about how data for learning and development is actionable, achievable, and most important possible. Awesome, and I just threw that up there so people can kind of see it uh, on the, and you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll throw the link in the chat too, because I think Craig is probably frantically Google searching it right now. Don't worry, Craig, I got you covered. And this is gonna <laughs> address that question, Brett. It's going to show how it is absolutely possible for learning and development to use credible, reliable, and valid data to answer the question to training work. We can do it just like anybody else. Awesome. I love that. I love that. Okay, here's another question from Craig. For a company who is starting up with no benchmark to measure from, basically no prior training department, so not a lot to start with, how do I show its worth? So for a company who is starting up with no benchmark to measure from, how do I show its worth? Yep. So I think that the first thing is that there is benchmark data that is out there and there are vendors and teams and organizations that is happy to share their data. So for example, if you go out to the ATD site, you can find some benchmark studies. You might be even able to go to a vendor with whom I work with a lot, metrics that matter. They might be able to provide some benchmark data as well. But here's the important question. When you are asked, answering the question, or when you're asking the question, how does learning development show value? That is a question to be answered by the business, right? So we don't answer the question, how do we show value? The business says, we have an initiative. We have a goal. We have a strategy in place. Here's how we believe learning and development can support that goal, support that initiative, support that strategy. So when it comes to what value is, how do you describe value? What does value look like? That is a question that we need to ask to the business, right? So if the business is doing something or trying to achieve something, we're in a conversation with the business. Again, it's back and forth. It's the business letting know how they believe um, we can add value and us you know, coming back with that to say, well, here's how we believe we can add value based on what you said. So again, to answer that question, the establishment of value or rather the definement of value is really driven by the business. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, and I think it's, it is, it is hard to get to when you're the one man band. Cause I, I, I know Craig and I know his situation and, and he's jumped in uh, a few times and actually had conversations with the, with the community as well. And so, so we're all kind of following his journey in this, uh, in this new job yeah. uh, in his space, which is another cool thing about TLDC. This like uh, just everybody being able to live sort of vicariously through everybody else. We're all learning yeah. so 
much more than we would normally do so with just having our own experiences. Yeah, um, this yeah. is great. And it looks like you really appreciated your answer too there. So yeah, I, have another, I have another follow-up for Craig. Now, Craig, you're taking over the conversation, but I love you for it. No worries. So if you're just starting on this journey um, to Craig and to everyone else, yeah. there is a way to change the type of data that we collect at the front end. Um, if you go to my website and you go to the ideas tab, You'll see at the bottom of the page, I believe it's somewhere near the bottom, where there is a survey, a learning survey that I created. And what it does is predict or forecast the impact of, or rather the impact on performance for learning and development. Yeah, so if you scroll down a little bit there, um, you'll see where there, yep, yep, downloads. Yep, it's that, that one. There you go, Craig and everybody else. So this one? Um, there are, ten, yeah, there are 10 questions. Scroll up a little bit. There are 10 questions via survey. Let's scroll up a little bit. Sorry. Uh, yeah, oh, just scroll up a little yep. bit. Yeah, there you go. There are 10 questions that you can ask immediately following a learning experience that forecast or predict the impact of learning and development on performance. So again, that's a start at showing value. Um, it shows value as it relates to forecast and performance, but really we want to take value all the way through to impact on goals. So, you know, that, that's something that might help uh, Craig and everyone else who has joined us today. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank that's you for sharing. Download, everybody. So go ahead, go at it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's fantastic. I, you know, all, all of the little tips and tricks and, and, and little tools and support items that people can, uh, can use are always appreciated. So, um, post the link, Brent. Well, absolutely, Craig. I can do that because I actually was prepared today, Craig. I asked all the right questions in the green room. Yeah, I was going to say, even in that document, you know, for those of you that are new to data analytics, I even show how to use data visualization to show the results. So again, if you're new at this, if you're just starting, if you don't have the deep expertise, I believe that that survey gives you a, a good start. Awesome. Here's another great question from Erica. She says, how do vendors make sure they are providing the right type of data so corporations can use that to show the value of outside training materials? So I'm, I'm guessing by outside training materials, I'm just wondering if Erica means um, content and resources that aren't necessarily owned by learning development. I'm wondering if, if that's what yeah, she that's means. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking outside materials like maybe um, uh, like uh, Linda. I'm just going to search on the internet or looking at a YouTube video. I or think so, yeah, like yeah. Linda.com or any sort of proprietary, like you, you buy a license to a whole bunch of content on, a, on an outside vendor's site yeah. and you access that material okay, and all that kind of stuff, I think. Okay, if that is what Erica means, there's absolutely a solution out there for that, for that, Erica. If you've heard of XAPI, it sounds as though you've talked about that a little bit, Brent. But one of the things that I like about XAPI uh, and the way in which it captures data is that it captures data from within LMD and from outside of LMD. So here's the example. So XAPI kind of sits on your LMS. It sits on your internet. It sits on your intranet. It sits on top of business data. And it pulls all that data together and it does what I like to call make all data created equal. So that way, if I have people who are searching for leadership topics and they're looking at YouTube videos on the internet, I can see that. If I have people who are Googling things like employee retention, how do I do a better job at retaining my employees? And they're going out and they're pulling down uh, white papers. Or if they're going out and listening to podcasts, XAPI can grab all of that data from those different sources that are not necessarily within or that are owned by learning and development, but it gives you a view into the extent to which there's utilization and the extent to which people are grabbing and using those different assets. Does that make sense? I think so. I'm, I'm just, I'm following the chat here. She's trying to clarify for us. And, okay. um, uh, yeah, she has. So we're following the XAPI concept, which is fine. Kim says, no, I think she's asking how a vendor like Cinecraft would be able to measure. And I think the answer is that the client would have to tell us we can't do it ourselves. Um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Agreed. 
Uh, Sam says XAPI is a great technical method to do f uh, to follow the chain of evidence, but it can't give us business goals. Um, yeah, we have to. That's true. The business the business gives us the goals, right? Okay. Um, and what XAPI does is grab the data that can support the extent to which learning development is impacting those goals. So the business has to give us the goals. And so Sam is absolutely right. Yeah. So, so here's another question from Ann, and she asks, how far down the performance line do you go in tracking training implementation, a.k.a. proof of learning put into practice? Yeah, that's a great question. And so there are different ways in which you can track and measure performance. And it really depends on the type of performance that you're measuring. So here's the example that I would give. Let's say that you're working in a hospital and there's a learning and development initiative to decrease patient fatalities based on incorrect dosage administration through needles. Okay, that was pretty specific, right? So yeah. if you're looking at the occurrence of death, <laughs> this sounds pretty morbid, but the example here is if you're, looking at, well, if you're <laughs> looking at the occurrence of death as a result of incorrect dosage administration through needles, then that gives you the performance data. Does that make sense, right? Yeah. So, I'll give you another example. Let's say that there is a learning initiative that helps call center professionals reduce the time it takes to resolve a customer call, okay? So what you can then get is performance data that shows how long it's taking people on one particular phone call to solve a customer problem. So maybe before the training program, it took a customer service representative six minutes to solve a customer call. But after the training initiative, it took them four minutes to solve a customer call. So that's an example of performance data. So you're looking at data that would show how people are behaving and performing on the job in which they're working, their day-to-day -day work. So you identify a performance or a skill or capability that is associated with the particular training initiative, and then you measure that skill or capability, its execution, as it manifests itself as someone's performance. I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, so I have an interesting question to kind of follow up with it though and maybe dive a little deeper. Have you ever run into an experience or maybe a client where where all of that was well and good, right? They're, they had this goal and everything and you're like, yeah, you know, all we, all we really need is access to that data. And they kind of scratched their head and said, um, what data? We don't really yes. collect that. Have, have yes. you ever run into that and, and had yes. to help them say, okay, step one is we need to figure out how to collect that data? Yes, that's absolutely the that perfect case. I'll go back to what I said earlier. What we do with data analytics is absolutely possible, but sometimes it's very hard. And just so that you guys feel my pain, <laughs> it's not always easy for me. And I do this all the time. You know, yeah. there are times where I am scratching my head to say, where am I going to find some reliable, credible performance data that shows the extent to which somebody's um, behavior is changing as a result of learning and development? And more often than not, it's, it's on a case by case by case by case basis. So you really can't cut and paste all the time with your method in terms of finding that performance data. Finding performance data is what I like to call the golden goose. And if we think about, say, Kirkpatrick's model, levels one and two, that data is really easy. So the data that we are uh, scratching our heads about right now is level three and level four. So again, it depends on what the specific uh, performance requirement is, what the specific behavior is, and then finding a way that you can capture data that accurately measures that particular behavior. So again, it goes back to those examples that I gave earlier. Maybe, for example, it's a car salesman. All right. So let's say that there's a car salesman who has gone through a training program for how to better engage with potential customers for the purpose of increasing sales of new models. Right. So if we see t sales tick up for that particular salesperson, then we can identify the extent to which that uptick is uh, is attributed to learning and development. So that's performance data. The other thing I want to add with that example, though, Brent, since I'm talking about that, is we need to isolate the impact. Because we know that training is not a silver bullet. Uh, training does not solve everything. So even when we're looking at performance data, we cannot, um, we cannot say that you know, a change in behavior is due to 100% of learning development. So we need to isolate that impact. I hope that answers the question. It was a long answer, but I hope it answers. No, that was, a, that was a great one, yeah. And, it, and as far as, you know, it just it reminds me of uh, 
you know, it's a, um, a lot of just basic research studies have to do the same thing, right? When they're, they're trying to find answers, they, they have to isolate kind of what change and then they have to measure it. And we're, we're really going through that same process, right, of, of needing to have more structured data collection in order to get the, um, the information we need in order to ask the right questions yeah. in order to solve those problems. That's right. And, and, well, and then I just want to shift a little bit back to that question, because, again, where we are most challenged as learning and development professionals focus on analytics data, analytic, uh, you know, analysis and data is the level three performance data and the level four uh, business impact data. And one of the things that I find to be very helpful is to go to the source. And by go to the source, I may go to the target audience. So one of the ways in which I've been successful is to go to the target audience to say, as a result of learning and de development, you know, your performance is expected to change in this way, in X or Y. And I'll ask them, if I want to uh, credibly and reliably measure whether or not there's a change in behavior or performance for you, where would you recommend I look? What should I take a look at? And that's where I can get, you know, the best reliable source. So we don't have to work in isolation. You know, sometimes when we're trying to figure things out, we don't have to figure it out all on our own. We can reach out to our target audiences. So I hope that that helps also. That does help a lot. And I'm, I'm getting the high sign that we're getting close to the top of the hour. So um, I think we might have to wrap this up here. But um, if you could just share just one last bit of insight about data and analytics, if people could just walk away today with just one, one thing that you think might help them, what could you share with them today? Yeah, I, I'll just share what I've shared before. Um, using data and analytics for training and learning and development is not always easy. There's no pixie dust. There's no magic potion. So while it may not be easy, it is absolutely possible. And if you don't have the expertise on your team to do it, you can do one of three things. You can hire it, you can buy it, or you can build it. It's absolutely possible. It's absolutely actionable. And it's not unrealistic to expect that learning and development can use data and analytics just like any other part of the business. Awesome. I love that. Kevin, it's been such a pleasure to meet you and to have you on today. This is great. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I love this topic, and I'm hoping that my passion and my energy for it has come through in our conversation today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm serious. we got to have you back on because, again, like I said, this is a hot topic, and I, I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. So I think everyone's going to have a lot more questions in the, in the coming weeks. So we'll reach out and stay in touch. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to come back and, you know, I, I think that you're going to open up the door for me to do this, but you know, there are a few ways that yeah. those on our, on our, uh, our webcast today can, can reach out to me personally. Yep. And I'll share that real quick with everybody as well. So don't forget, you can follow Kevin on his, uh, on his Twitter stream. So he is um, at Kevin M Yates. Don't forget the M everybody. And the website is the same way. Kevin M Yates.com. And uh, you, you have a Facebook page too, you said, and LinkedIn, I'm yep, sure. Yep, yep. And, and the thing is, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you or answer any questions or just try to figure this out together. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Again, thank you so much, Kevin. We really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And I just want to say goodbye and thank you for your time, all of my learning and development brothers and sisters out there. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to close your video window, but you'll still be here. And so if you want to, uh, you know, jump into the chat and follow up with okay. some folks or anything, feel free to do that as well. Okay. Thanks, Thank you Kevin. for the invitation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Bye, All everybody. Right. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. I think we just gave everybody in the chat more value than you could ever possibly imagine. Special thanks to Kevin. Let's give him another round of applause. Awesome, awesome work. Uh, again, really appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us today. This was a great crowd. Great questions, too, by the way. All of this stuff is important to what we do. I see a lot of fresh new names in uh, the chat as well. I hope everybody was reaching out and saying hi to the new folks that uh, uh, 
um, that that maybe have not been here before and um, telling them all about uh, TLD chat in the Slack and the website and all the other great stuff. Don't forget to introduce yourselves to each other too. Remember the most important thing about what we do here at TLDC is this community. And uh, by just reaching out and getting to know each other, we are all making the industry as a whole a better place. And um, so make everybody feel welcome, engage. And it is 10 o'clock. And so I will say adios. Thank you all so much. It was a fantastic conversation. And we will see you all tomorrow, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. UK time. Everybody have a great day. Bye, everybody.